Welcome to this Wisconsin Facets webinar on transitions and preschool options, educational considerations for young children with disabilities. My name is Emily Brownell, and I'm the Early Childhood Specialist at the Wisconsin Family Assistance Center for Education, Training, and Support. This presentation was designed to provide information to families, caregivers, and providers working with families by a team that represents birth to three program, early childhood special education service agencies, and parents. Our hope is to provide perspective and share experiences to improve understanding and empower each participant to know their role in the transition process. So what brings us here today is to focus on the process of your child transitioning from birth to three program into early childhood special education into the public school and or community services and understanding the options that need to be considered. To have smooth transitions, it's important to plan ahead. As your child nears his or her third birthday, families face leaving services they are, have been comfortable with and that have helped to plan. Families also face the possibility of going to the public school system, to a system that we know in the context of our own education. And some of families experience stress knowing that services will change when their child turns three. Families have many questions. They are, for example, what are my hopes for my child? What are my expectations for my child now and in the future? What does my child need now to grow and develop? Where do I want our child to learn and play? Where would our child be if he or she didn't have a developmental disability? What preschool educational experiences would meet my child's early learning needs? And where do we as families start? It's best to be proactive and plan ahead. So it is the federal legislation that makes it possible for our little ones to receive services under birth to three program or part C or under early childhood special education, which is part B section 619. IDEA is federal law which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. These laws govern the state special education and each have regulations. As you may know, early intervention in Wisconsin is called Birth to Three program. These services are provided by a county up until the child turns age three and are overseen by the Department of Health Services, IDEA, 2004 requires that services be provided in natural environments which refer to services being provided to children where they typically spend their day. For example, home, daycare, or another program. Uh, services for three through five-year-olds are called early childhood special education and are, and are overseen by the Department of Public Instruction a full continuum of alternative placements must be considered when determined where the child will receive services. Children are to receive special ed education and related services in the least restrictive environment. So there are two different parts programs we're talking about in two different systems um, and trying to work together and transition between the two. <clears throat> so parents don't have to go it alone when planning for the future of their child. There are supports and resources to help families in this process of planning for the future. A team approach is the most effective way to navigate through this transition. But, as we know, being part of a team does require work. Janice Fialka is the parent of a child with developmental disability and a national trainer on parent-professional partnerships. She says, effective partnerships between parents and professionals require collaboration. Plopped right in the middle of that word, you will find the word labor. 
partnership is labor, it is hard work. The goal is to develop an effective collaborative working relationship with the focus being on the child. So a family whose child receives birth to three program services was involved with the process of an initial referral, a screening and evaluation, the determination eligibility, and the individualized family service plan, or IFSP development. And finally, they received early intervention services for this child. So if they've been in birth to three, they've kind of been through all of these first few steps, referral, down to services begin. As the child nears age three, planning must begin to ready the child and the family for the next level of possible services. Again, the local education agency, or LEA, the family will go through in Part B is a referral process, a screening and evaluation, process, so referral, evaluation, determination of eligibility, and then an individualized education program, or IEP, development. And finally, services will begin. It is the Transition Planning Conference, right down here, and referral to the LEA that bridges these two service delivery systems. So we as parents need to prepare for this transition. We need to think about and be able to communicate our high expectations we have for our children to our children and to those working with us and our children because these high expectations have a positive influence on our child's growth. We begin to gather information to get an idea of what life after birth to three program will look like by doing a few things. One is talking with others who know your child, like extended family care providers, friends, and other parents who have gone through the process, as well as the birth to three program service coordinator and other providers. Also helps by thinking about your own hopes and dreams for your child, like growing up healthy, living independently someday, having a job, thinking about your child's strengths, what your child can do, their interests, what motivates your child, and needs. What areas does your child need help with? And also thinking about what kinds of things you would like to see your child doing as a three to five year old, or goals that you have, like dressing or eating independently, for example. And then also thinking about where you'd like your child to spend his or her day. You also need to Explore resources and types of programs or services available in the community. Each community is different and what's available um, might look different from community to community. And deciding on who you would like to be involved in the transition planning process. Would you like family, other family members, friends, clergy, other professionals? But finally, Remembering to ask those questions. Don't hesitate to ask questions. All of your concerns are important, and if left unexpressed, misunderstandings may occur. Nothing else. Ask why. Why? Why is this this way? <clears throat> so birth to three has a certain set of responsibilities. So while we're thinking about and preparing for a transition, the professionals who have been with us to this point are also planning and working toward the transition um, by providing the family with information about the transition process, including written transition steps and activities in the IFSP, options for services or activities after age three, discussion with family about potential eligibility of local education services, 
development of a plan with the family for how to support transition out of the birth to three program. And then there will also be transition meetings occurring whether or not found potentially eligible. And then also IDA 2004 requires birth to three staff to notify LEA if child potentially is eligible for Part B services. Potential eligibility for LEA services is determined at a discussion with the family about the child's current levels of functioning and development to determine if the child may meet eligibility requirements for LEA services. If the answer is yes, the child is referred to the LEA. Other options for services are also discussed. If the answer is no, the child's transition plan will explore other options for services besides the school or LEA. This t discussion typically occurs around the child's age of two years to two years, six months. So referral to the LEA is required for all children determined potentially eligible for LEA services. Our, our referral consists of notifying the LEA of the child's name, date of birth, parent contact information, and that the child has been determined potentially eligible for LEA services. The date the referral is sent and received by the LEA begins their timelines. Families choose whether or not additional information is sent to the LEA by consenting to have additional information shared with the LEA via a release. If a family does not agree with the decision regarding the potential eligibility for LEA services, they have the right to dispute the decision. If the referral is sent per requirements, the family that does not want to have their child participate in school services at this time can say no to the LEA. They do have this by documenting no consent on the consent to conduct evaluations form sent to them by the LEA. So all the work being done on the part of the families and the birth to three professionals culminate in a transition planning conference. But when exactly will this be and what will it do? So um, it occurs, must occur between the child's age of two years, three months, and two years, nine months before the child's third birthday. IDA states that the invited LEA will participate in transition planning conferences arranged by the designated birth to three program lead agency. So the transition planning conference is first and foremost focused on the child. Um, others, such as Head Start, Child Care, et cetera, can be invited. The transition planning conference then serves to discuss and describe and review the roles of those involved in the transition planning and are attending the transition conference for instance, the role of the school district representative is as a guest there to learn more about the child and to help define the next steps in the transition process. The role of the Birth to Three program is to discuss present services, and the family's role is to share information about their, chi about their child and provide input. It's also the transition planning conference um, is also a place where the child's current programming and services are discussed, the future service delivery options, meaning what would be the least restricted environment in which the child's needs can be met, it's the beginning of new agency involvement for a family, and an update to or the development of a transition plan to include among other things, who will do what by when. <clears throat> so who should be a part of the transition planning conference? We have who's required, the family, the local educational agency representative, and birth to three program staff. It's an important role we as parents play in deciding who to invite in the transition planning conference. First, we 
We need people who know us, who have information to share about our child, and who is our support system. Then we need to invite the professionals who have information to share about our child and his or her progress. Finally, we'll We'll need to invite those agencies who may provide services in the future. So that may be schools, Head Start programs, preschools, daycare centers, etc. So the key three will be Parents, Birth to Three program, and LEA, but you may invite and others who may attend are friends, relatives, others be therapists, um, other early intervention, early childhood professionals, and programs in the community. <clears throat> so of those key three, what are their roles? We've kind of touched on this a little bit, but we'll dig a little deeper. So we as parents have played the important role in deciding who to invite in the transition planning conference. And, as we've touched on previously, those invited have certain jobs or roles to play at the meeting. What shall we as parents be prepared to do at this meeting? So, we as parents, our role will be to share hopes and concerns, share strengths and needs of your child's development, ask questions, learn about transition procedures, Identify potential settings, programs, and services you'd be interested in for your child. And potentially sign referral forms and release of records. So special note, the LEA must send an invitation to the initial IEP team meeting to the Birth to Three Program Service Coordinator or other representatives of Birth to Three Program at the request of the parent. This should be discussed at the Transition Planning Conference. Okay, so um, when discussing the IEP, the Birth to Three program staff isn't automatically going to be invited. Parents need to say they want them invited. So what will the school do at the transition planning conference? So what is um, expected as a potential provider of that service to your child, the school will be taking note of the hopes, dreams, and goals and concerns you have for your child. They'll share an overview of the referral process, the IEP process, the eligibility and placement options, and they'll also share the parental rights. The services children receive under special education is outlined by legal definition. As a part of this, it is required that parents be informed of their rights under this law. This transition planning conference may be the time and place that this is introduced. So your child may receive programming or services from community-based programs such as a daycare, preschool, or Head Start program. If involved in the transition planning conference, a representative from that program will learn from you about your child and discuss their programs, programming and services, their eligibility requirements, if any. For example, thinking of um, a daycare may have a potty training requirement or a preschool may have a potty training requirement or, or may have um, for Head Start a certain, um, you know, uh, income requirement. Um, identify any support or resource needs required to meet needs of the child in their program. Yes, if a nurse is needed or equipment, sign language training, etc. And they must also disclose or give specific information about program costs if there are any. For example, um, the tuition that's needed. So this timeline from referral to placement, um, <clears throat> it's important to follow it to prevent gaps in services for children. 
So this is for children that have already been receiving services and starting the transition process before two years and nine months from the Birth to Three program. If a parent does not wish to pursue the evaluation and eligibility process, remember they should check the box on the form denying consent for additional testing and return it to the LEA. If the LEA does not receive a response from the parents denying consent, the LEA will continue to contact them. Even if a parent has denied consent, the parent can re-refer the child for the evaluation if at a later time they feel their child has not progressed. And you notice this is from um, Update Bulletin 0601. Um, that is not one that I shared, but if you um, search on the DPI website, you will find this information. So then, <clears throat> it's interesting, um, the timeline and summer birthdays. So we stated previously that in a perfect system, it is the intent that there be no gaps in service from the end point of the Birth to Three program to the beginning of early childhood special education. So unlike year-round Birth to Three program services, early childhood special education services are available only during the school year and possibly during on an extended school year basis. Generally, children turning three during the school year begin school services when they turn three. But when the birthday is in late spring or over the summer, that poses some challenges as to an appropriate transition from birth to three program services to early childhood special education and the start date for your child. It will take creative planning on the part of the birth to three program team and the IEP team to determine how the child will be best supported in his or her transition from birth to three program to early childhood special education. Possible scenarios. <clears throat> A child may leave birth to three program earlier in the spring to begin services in the school before the end of the school year. Early childhood special education may begin for a child with the IEP may be implemented through extended school year services. It may be decided that early childhood special education services will begin at the start of the new school year if the IEP is written for the start of the school year. So for more information about extended school year, um, please refer to DPI Bulletin 96.01. <clears throat> Excuse me. What are the LEA's responsibilities regarding the provision of special education for eligible children um, transitioning from birth to three programs when they attain the age of three? The LEA must have an IEP in effect by the child's third birthday. LEAs in county birth to three programs have found it helpful to enter into agreements which include timely re referral procedures to ensure that the LEA has sufficient time to complete the IEP process prior to the child's third birthday. For children with summer birthdays, the LEA must begin to implement the IEP during the summer if the extended year school year services are required. If the child does not require extended school year services, the beginning date of the IEP would be identified as the first day of school in the fall. If the child does not require extended school year services and the child has a completed IEP with services designated for the beginning of the school year in the fall, the birth to three program may decide to continue IFSP services until the start of the IEP. Remember, it is individualized, what is best for your child, and it is met by having the conversation, the discussion, and agreement with, between all parties. There isn't a um, one-size-fits-all. <clears throat> so the development of the IEP includes all of the above, as well as the consideration of preschool options. In 
In determining eligibility, what the IEP team is trying to decide upon is, does this child have an educational impairment? Does this impairment adversely affect the child's education performance? And is this child in need of special education? So how the IEP team members will determine whether or not there is an impairment, IEP team members will conduct evaluations. IEP team members will start by looking at the information they already have, so information from the Transition Planning Conference, birth to three program records, referral reports, etc. If a team member feels that additional testing is needed to obtain more information, they will ask for your consent before any testing or other means of gathering data is done. The focus of the evaluations is to answer the following questions. Is your child a child with a disability? Does the child's disability adversely affect the child's educational or developmental performance? And is there a need for special education and related services? If the answer to these questions is yes, then educational goals and objectives will be developed in an IEP, Individualized Education Plan member will be drafted with the involvement of the family. This IEP is a plan for what special educational services your child needs and will receive. A child must meet eligibility criteria in one or more of these educational disability areas and show a need for special educational services before an IEP can be developed. <clears throat> Children ages 3 to 5 can be eligible for early childhood special education services if or when they meet the criteria under any of these areas. And if you, there is, Um, if you would like the formal <laughs> language, but there is um, Public Law 11.35, Determination of Eligibility um, and Areas of Impairment. Uh, if you'd like more in-depth information, also if you Google CISA 7 website, that is also a place for more information. So once the IEP team has concluded the child is a child who is in need of special educational services, the process enters the next phase, the determination of placement or where the special educational services will be provided. The law states that students receiving special educational services will receive those services in their least restrictive environment and with their non-disabled peers to the maximum extent appropriate. For students kindergarten age and older, the elementary school would most likely be the most appropriate place for the special educational services to be made available. The kindergarten classroom should be the first appropriate environment consideration for delivery of special education services. But for a preschooler, where would be the most appropriate environment for the school to provide services? It may seem like it takes a long time to get to this answer. The Individual with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, includes language specifically addressing consideration for preschoolers. <clears throat> IDEA provides a legal definition of what preschool options are and what IDEA requires. IDEA describes options as a full continuum of alternative placements, including integrated placement options such as community-based settings with typically developing age peers must be available to preschool children with disabilities. The full continuum extends from settings fully educated with non-disabled children to separate classrooms only with children with disabilities and then everything in between. So what this all means is that your school district must consider a variety of educational settings for young children with disabilities 
taking into consideration where does your child usually spend his or her day? Can the educational goals and objectives that were developed by the IEP team be addressed in that setting? And if not, what other setting or settings for service delivery will best meet the child's needs? To determine an appropriate setting for early childhood special edu education services, what must be taken into consideration is the age-appropriate activities, the general curriculum, and the interaction opportunities with typically developing peers. And the handout um, shared with you Bulletin 10.03 on free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment per, for preschoolers with disabilities. It's a place where you can go for more information from the Department of Public Instruction. So research studies support offering a variety of education settings or options. In the findings to the IDA, Congress states almost 30 years of research and experience has demonstrated that the education of children with disabilities can be made more effective by having high expectations for such children and ensuring their access to the general education curriculum in the regular classroom program to the maximum extent possible in order to meet developmental goals and to the maximum, maximum extent possible the challenging expectations that have been established for all, all children. Research supports the benefit of inclusion for young children with and without disabilities. Studies have shown that individualized evidence-based strategies for children with disabilities can be implemented successfully in inclusive early childhood programs. Children with disabilities, including those with the most significant disabilities and the highest needs, can make significant developmental and learning progress in inclusive settings. Some studies have shown that children with disabilities in inclusive settings experience greater cognitive and communication development than children with disabilities who were in separate settings with this being particularly apparent among children with more significant disabilities. And further, children with disabilities tend to have similar levels of engagement as their, develop, as their typically developing peers and are more likely to practice newly acquired skills in inclusive settings as compared to separate settings. Likewise, research suggests that children's growth and learning are related to their peer skills and the effects are most pronounced for children with disabilities. High quality inclusion that begins early and continues into school likely produces the strongest outcomes. Studies have shown that children with disabilities who spend more time in general education classrooms tend to be absent fewer days from school and have higher test scores in reading and math than those who spend less time in general education classes. And spending more time in general education classes was related to a higher probability of employment and higher earnings down the road. In addition to making learning and achievement gains, children with disabilities in inclusive early childhood programs also demonstrate stronger social emotional skills than their peers in separate settings. These social benefits are robust and can continue into elementary school and beyond. Studies have found also that children with disabilities in inclusive classrooms demonstrated more social interactions with peers with and without disabilities, had larger networks of friends, and were more socially competent compared to children in separate settings. Importantly, while studies indicate that inclusive services produce benefits for children with disabilities, these desired outcomes are achieved only when young children with disabilities are included several days per week in social and learning opportunities with typically developing peers. 
and specialized instructional strategies are used to meet children's individual needs. Systems supports such as resources for professional development, ongoing coaching and collaboration, and time for communication and planning are critical to ensure that programs and personnel can adequately meet the needs of individual children. Additionally, the developmental benefits of early childhood incl inclusion can be lost if children are placed in separate settings in preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school. Inclusion in early childhood settings, followed by inclusion in elementary school, can sustain these developmental gains. It's important to note that children without disabilities can also benefit from inclusive early childhood programs. Studies indicate that typically developing children can show positive developmental, social, and attitudinal outcomes from inclusive experiences. They are capable of demonstrating greater compassion and empathy and can have a more positive perception of children with disabilities when peer interactions are adequately supported by classroom teachers. They can also develop a better understanding of diversity and disability as concepts. And when programs and teachers have an advanced understanding and capacity for individualizing learning and can provide appropriate developmental supports for each child, all children can benefit because all children learn best with individualized supports. Children without disabilities in high quality inclusive early childhood settings also benefit from developmental specialists who can identify and address delays in development that might otherwise not be identified. And I have included the joint position statement from the United States Department of Education and the United States Department of Health and Human Services um, on inclusion from 2015 in the handouts. That's a, it's a really great, <laughs> um, 43 pages, but it has great information. <coughs> By now, you've heard a lot of new terms, and during the IEP meeting, the school staff may use these terms when talking about considering a range of service options. So we have the least restrictive environment is the setting in which the services can be delivered that it is most closely aligned to the natural setting. Preschool inclusion is preschool services in an inclusive setting with their non-disabled peers. Natural environments is where does your preschooler typically spend their day and how do they spend their day? What are their routines? Typical settings are where do most preschoolers typically spend their days? Age-appropriate settings where is the program located or housed? And is it an appropriate setting for preschoolers? Routines-based interventions are providing services during the routines of the day, those teachable moments. You know, getting ready, eating meals, cleaning up, nap time, bath time. And itinerant services to preschool setting is teachers or therapists go to the child where they're at versus a child going to a site for therapy or services. There is no one right way to deliver special education services. Your plan should be unique to your child and his or her educational needs. Family and community norms and expectations will also be reflected when planning for your child. So we spent a great deal of time discussing that the IEP team must consider a variety of educational settings in which to deliver special educational services to a young child with a disability. So now let's take a look at what some of the settings would look like. We have some images at a school daycare setting program, possibly at home. Wisconsin began early childhood special education before IDEA mandated services for young children. A structure was formed that served young children in schools-based special education classrooms. 
You've been hearing about an array of options, and Wisconsin is continually moving forwards, encouraging communities to increase the number of educational settings and servicing, serving young children in environments other than early childhood classrooms. Today in Wisconsin, we are seeing services for young children in such settings as we have some general education settings and then other settings like special education classrooms, home, one-to-one -one services, residential facility, and a separate school. One-to-one -one services outside the home are where some children come into the school for short sessions to improve, for example, speech skills. A part-time combination example where a child receives some special education services in their general education environment and then receives some individual or small group or separate services in a special educational classroom setting. Um, residential facilities remain an option that is used less frequently and a few school districts still maintain separate school buildings where only special education services are delivered. <clears throat> so it is the IEP team that includes you, the parent, that will ultimately determine what services will best serve your child's educational needs and where the services will be provided. Just as each child and each community in Wisconsin is different and unique. Early childhood special educational services, programs, and settings will look different from community to community, reflecting the needs of the child, the family's needs and values, county and school district interagency agreements, the community's dynamics or cultures as a whole, as well as the community-based services and supports for families. So ending that, it all happens one child at a time. When all participants, families and providers are informed, when all team members work together for the benefit of the child, when communities work together to share resources, it happens one child at a time. So there are places where parents and professionals can get more information and training on the development of service options for preschool children. I listed them above. <clears throat> we have Wisconsin Facets, um, Wisconsin Statewide Parent Education um, Parent Educator Initiative. Um, I will give an updated number. Um, Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction, the Wisconsin Department of Human Health Services Birth to Three Program, and the Wisconsin Early Childhood Collaborating Partners. And that concludes our presentation on transition and preschool options. Thank you so much for attending, um, and please remember to fill out the SurveyMonkey questionnaire at the end when you receive the link for the recording.